Compared to white Americans in the United States, there are twice as likely number of African Americans who will die from diabetes. Also, if you look at rates of diagnosis of breast cancer, you'll find that African American women, although diagnosed at the same rates as white women in the US, they are 40% more likely to die. When we look at rates of cervical cancer in the United States compared to white women, Hispanic women are 60% more likely to be diagnosed with advanced stage cervical cancer. Why are these things important? They're important because they affect each and every one of us in some way, shape, or form, whether or not you belong to any of those ethnic groups. I am Dr. Carrie Norris. I am the Chief of Health Policy and Administration at the Fulton DeKalb Hospital Authority. And I have worked on this for various years, over 17 years. Health disparities are plaguing our communities. But what I propose today is that the answer is hiding in plain sight. Let's talk a little bit about how to get to that answer. So we see various causes of death throughout the United States. These are all the leading causes of death. And when you look at this, you may say, oh, well, those all look like things that are preventable. They are. And with the work that we can do together to address the lack of prevention that we have, to also address behavioral risk that people continue to take, to also look at family history and genetics of what people inherit from each of their family members, and to also think about person's environment. Did you know that where you live dictates whether or not you live or die more so than your family history? Your zip code is more important than your genetic DNA. Think about that. And think about where people live and how they live and how that affects what they have access to or what they don't have access to. We also have to think about when we talk about access, just giving a person insurance or giving them transportation is not enough. Access is a plethora of things that have to work together to form the, in the most perfect environment for the person to get all that he or she needs. Also, we're gonna talk about competing interests. That means if I know that I have been diagnosed with diabetes and my insulin costs a lot of money, but I'm also thinking about what am I gonna feed my kids? How am I gonna pay this light bill? And I've been sick for several days and so I've missed some days off work. Then how does that affect whether or not I can actually purchase my insulin and take care of myself. So when we have these competing interests and I have to decide between feeding my children and actually being able to move forward and take better care of myself and stick with medication adherence, then we really have to think about how people are making these decisions and what it is that they have to do when they're making these decisions. So here we can see across various disparities and across various things such as blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke, African Americans are more likely to die at earlier ages than any other group in the United States. We also have higher rates of actual diagnosis. Why is that? Let's talk a little bit more about it. Most people think when we are addressing those disparities, and they think that when we are looking at gaps in access and gaps in health care, that the answer is equality. Just give everybody the same amount of access. Just give everybody the same pair of shoes, and it should work. Well, as we know, that doesn't work. And this is the work that we've been doing for several years. Good work, nothing to knock any of the past researchers who've come before and who've done some really groundbreaking work. Equality doesn't work when it comes to health disparities. We've got to think of it very, very differently. What works is equity. If you see in the picture on your right-hand side, you'll see that with equity, you meet the person where they are to ensure that they have the same viewpoint, to ensure that they have equal footing. 
And that's what we need to think about when we talk about equity. But I propose that this is a really good model, but there are some issues there as well. And the answer and the solution, again, to health equity is in that picture, but it's hiding in plain sight. So what is it that we don't see in the picture? Dr. Arlene Geronimus out of the University of Michigan has stated, the stressors that impact people of color are chronic and repeated through their whole life course. So I want you to think about that. Not the life course of, oh, when I become an adult, now I have these bills, I don't wanna be a child anymore, oh, my aching back, none of those things. But more so, when you are in your mother's belly, whatever stress she experiences, you are subjected to that exact same stress. And so, as you can see here, stressors affect all parts of the body system. And if a woman is pregnant and she's carrying a child, there's no way that stress doesn't have an effect early on on the fetus, on the baby, and then it becomes something that leads them to early disease and early death. Your body systems are stressed out. Any type of trauma, any type of chronic stress, and I'm not talking about just Atlanta traffic. <clears throat> we know that's stressful and you find ways to get around that. But let's think about, again, you're a single parent or you're paying bills or you live in poverty or you're trying to get ahead simple things. You can't feed your family. Everybody's always talking about all of this great nutrition stuff and go organic and buy organic and let's get it together and do better with our nutrition and more physical activity. If I live in a neighborhood where it is not safe for me to exercise outside, that's an issue. There's a problem. If I don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, if I don't have the money to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables, it becomes an issue and a problem down the road that then presents itself in various forms of disease and later on possibly disability or death. So what I want you to think about is something that Dr. Geronimus proposed, which is called the weathering hypothesis. Think of this tattered house as the body of yourself or the body of a parent or mother who's carrying a child. The storms of life continue to come. The challenges of life continue to come. And we have absolutely no control over those things. Bad things happen all the time. But when it's chronic and when it continually happens to people, then we see that what happens is this tattering. It tears away at your very frame. It tears away at your very being, from your mental health all the way down to your physical health. So think of this house as your body. Think of this house as the body of a woman who is carrying a child. As, as it tatters away at her, and the paint chips, the shutters fall down, the roof has a leak, you know, the floor, the floorboards are lifting up, then I need you to consider that all of those things are also affecting any child that she is carrying. And you are subjected to stress and trauma in utero. So before you even are born, these are the things that you are dealing with. And that puts you at risk for early death and early disease, which is what we see in a lot of vulnerable populations and minority populations. Let's move on. When we think about trauma, again, we're still talking about the child. We're thinking about trauma that happens to a parent. Let's say a parent's in an abusive relationship and they're being physically or financially abused. The mother's pregnant, she's enduring all of this. The child is experiencing trauma early on. And then when the child is born, they're then experiencing the trauma of the household, the constant fighting, the arguing, the fear, the anxiety that they develop, all of these things. And so it leads to mental health issues, which lead to physical health issues. It will manifest itself physically. And so consider that as the child goes from birth to death, 
you get an early death because of the exposure to trauma. Constant, complex, compounded trauma, one on top of the other, is not helpful. The effect of the stress on your body leads to early disease and early death. So when we think about that and we think about this childhood trauma and the long-term impact, lots of people have studied this. If you've heard of ACEs, it looks at traumatic events in a child's life. Did you lose a parent? Did you lose a grandparent? Um, were you sick early? Did you grow up in poverty? Were you sexually abused? Um, did you suffer any other type of verbal abuse in your household? Did you watch a parent be abused in the household? So these are all things that, and we're talking about children who are still developing mentally and physically. And when they are in that position and they're learning fear and that fear is memorized in their cells and that fear is encapsulated in their body with no release and no way of knowing how to cope because we as adults don't always know how to cope. Then again, it sets in it starts to become a problem with their mental health where they may develop PTSD, you may have some type of depression, you may have some anxiety disorders, things of that nature, which then lead to hypertension because you're always in this state of anxiety and you're always in this state of, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? And when that happens to you, your blood pressure shoots up. When your blood pressure shoots up, then you're at high risk for diabetes, heart attack, stroke, you see where I'm going with this? It's important to pay attention to this. And so we see the common causes. We see that children um, who experience trauma are twice as likely to develop depression and three times more likely to develop anxiety. So I also want to talk a little bit about access because the access in and of itself for children of color there's a disparity that's there as well. White children are more likely to have access to the mental health treatment early on to learn how to cope and to get the intervention that's needed so that they don't have some of the early death, disability, and also disease that we see a lot in communities of color. So here's what I want you to consider. Again, here we are with this equality versus equity model. Did you see what changed? The final picture shows that they changed the fence. So it's not wooden, it's a link chain fence now. What's the issue there? They're still on the outside. Who thought that this was still a solution? So what's hiding in plain sight is the fact that in all of these pictures, you are going from everybody's equal, we're gonna give everybody the same box, to we're gonna meet the need of the people by giving them boxes that put them at the same level. Still doesn't work. And they couldn't figure out why that doesn't work. Well, we're meeting the people with what they need. If it's money, we give that. If it's food, you know, we have these farmers markets and great interventions that are going on in the community. If it's physical activity, we're coming up with various programs in schools and in communities to get people walking, safer routes to school, all kinds of great things. Nothing should be taken away from those programs. But again, the part that is missing is they're still on the outside of the fence. Nobody's addressed the mental health issues. Nobody's addressed that tattered house that represents the child who has been through enough trauma and stress by the time that they're five or six without coping mechanisms that they don't know what to do. And they're already on this life course of having early death, early disease, disability, is it fair? Is it right? Absolutely not. Even if it's not directly you, it's your neighbors, it's your coworkers, it's your employees for your company. It's gonna cost you a lot in insurance. It's gonna cost you a lot of sick days. It's gonna cost you a lot of productivity. So I think that when we 
look at these pictures, we don't take away from the models because of course everything is stepwise. What we learn should be stepwise. We should learn from past examples, past models, things of that nature. But what's missing is the mental health piece. So I propose that we go with what I like to call the Mr. Model. I took all the people out because people were arguing over these pictures. What color are the people? Are they peach? Are they brown? Are they, it doesn't matter. What matters are the actual concepts. What matters is how the concepts are linked and how we put those things together to then address what's going on in communities. So in the mental health aspect, it would require that we address mental health early on you teach kids coping skills early on to deal with stressors and how to cope and how to address. Self-soothing works. My grandson does it. He's seven. Sometimes he gets in trouble in class because he goes to soothe the other kids. Because he wants to get up and say, are you okay? It's all right. Just breathe. You know, things that his parents have taught him for when, you know, he's stressed or things are a bit much for him. That can be taught. Children know how to meditate. They know how to center themselves and be quiet and focus on their breathing and everything else. You have to teach coping. You have to get mental health help before that first episodic break, before they're 19 or 21 and away at college or at their first job and there is a major break in and someone has to call you because they've been admitted somewhere. You have to think about integrated care. Every time you go for any type of physical care, they should be checking on your mental health. And I mean something beyond that one question they ask all of us. Have you been sad the last 30 days? <laughs> Lady, I've been sad my whole life. <laughs> what are you talking about? Because if it's chronic stress and chronic depression, you don't see it as other people see it. You're not going to say, oh, that's depression. You're going to say, that's been my life my whole life. How's it any different? So think about that. Socioeconomic status. Sure, people can get great jobs, they can become educated, they can get insurance and access, but if you are not creating workforce development programs in those communities that are still behind, then you've got some work to do. Transportation, having access to get to the doctor, or putting clinics in neighborhoods so that people have the access that they need. So that goes hand in hand with the access piece and the basic need for housing. If people have a home, they are more likely to do better. They can focus, they can concentrate, they can get their actual insurance cards and everything else at their address. They can receive services, they can have access to whatever resources are in the neighborhood or available to the neighborhood. I want you to think about this Mr. Model, which is named after my son. We are our own study. And I want you to think how this moves equity forward for the mental health piece at earlier stages and in early intervention. And so the next time someone talks to you, about health disparities or anything else, I want you to say this to them. So right now, we're gonna do something. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Neighbor. Okay, I'm not feeling it. I'm not hearing it loud enough. So we're gonna change that. We're not gonna say neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and say, mister. Can I get some health equity? That is how you're going to remember this model. Mr. Can I get some health equity? And for that, I thank you for listening today.